Saturday. Today I'm going to be doing a live with Sarah. Sarah is a CRNA out in California and I posted about her earlier uh, this week on Thursday. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, so she's going to be joining us here soon. Oh, she's ready. Look, man, she, I, I like this woman already. She is prompt. So we're going to be hearing from her shortly. Hi, everyone. Hey, guys. Hey, Melissa. Hi. Hey. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let me get this so it's nice and steady. Sorry. That's okay. There we go. Do you guys have? Yes, you can see me, right? Yay. There. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much, Crystal. This is wonderful. Yes, it is. I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Yeah. <laughs> So I will let you introduce yourself. Um, you can tell us, um, you know, your background, where you went sure. to RNA school, any of those things, and then we can get into the questions. Perfect. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Sarah Bergacker, and um, Crystal mentioned I'm from California. The um, Our upcoming Mooksley event, um, which we'll talk about what Mooksley stands for, is in California. Um, I'm actually in Michigan. Um, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so I'm a Michigan resident. Um, I live on the west side um, of the state. And um, a little bit about my background in healthcare and nursing. I um, got my LPN degree. Um, I sat for my boards when I was 18 years old. And so I uh, knew from a really young age I wanted to go into healthcare. And my plan was to use my LPN to put myself in through my pre med degree. And then I'm so thankful that I did that because I realized I loved nursing and the philosophy of nursing and um, the whole approach to care. So um, changed from being pre-med to being my bachelor's in nursing. Um, along the way, I got my MRS degree too, met my husband, and he's an emergency room nurse. So we did travel nursing, which... Um, you and I are both CRNAs now, but I know a lot of people have questions about travel nursing too. So we did travel nursing for about three years. And then um, from the time I got my LPN until CRNA school um, was 10 years. And I was an RN for about five or six of that. Um, went to CRNA school. I went to Oakland University uh, in the east side of Michigan. Michigan has five programs. Um, we are a wonderful state. Um, to be a CRNA in, and um, we actually had our state association meeting last week, and there's about 2,500 of us now. Um, so oh it's God. so wow. thankful. Yeah, yeah, to be a part of um, just such an incredible tribe of people. I have been a CRNA. I finished um, the end of 2009. I went straight into rural independent practice. Um, I grew up in rural Michigan. I love living rural and um relate really well to people in the rural setting. And then um, I also love pediatrics. I was a peds ER nurse um, for several years. Um, so I went straight into independent practice. Uh, independent practice in like the CRNA realm means that you're practicing solo um, without an anesthesiologist. And so right out of school was taking solo call, covering OB in all the service lines in the hospital. Um, and then the majority of my time since I graduated, I have been in the rural independent setting. Um, just the last two years, I've been working at a level two trauma center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and so I love kind of the combination of everything. Um, there's things you get in the, the urban setting that, um, you don't get in rural and vice versa. So along the way, I developed a deep love for ultrasound uh, guided nerve blocks and then also um, point of care ultrasound, um, the acronym, especially on Twitter for point of care is POCUS. So um, POCUS is just using ultrasound at the bedside in real time as a qualitative diagnostic tool. Um, so that's the clinical stuff I'm interested in. And then, uh, the last semester of my senior year of CRNA school, um, our program director gave me such a gift. I didn't realize it at the time. It just felt daunting, but she had me start lecturing. 
in our program. And um, I just never stopped. So I taught at Oakland University, uh, my alma mater, um, for the 10 years that I've been out. And then I've started doing some professional meetings, state association meetings. And um, the last two years, I have taught um, point of care ultrasound and regional nerve blocks at the hands-on sessions at the National Congress for Nurse Anesthetist. Wow. So, um, and then through all of that, was going through my own personal journey that overlaps always into your professional journey. And um, we can talk more about that, but out of the last year, um, Mooksley was born, which is a continuing education. Um, I like to call it a community for nurse anesthetists, uh, Mooksley is M-O-O-X-L-I, and it stands for Move, Oxygenate, Live. And our goal is once you join the Mooksley community, you move your mindset, so your perspective and the way you um, look at things. Um, you oxygenate your soul, and you live differently. Um, so much of what we do as nurse anesthetists is evidence-based care of others, and there's a lot of burnout in our profession. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of substance abuse, um, and there's a lot of other numbing that goes on, um, you know, whether it's spending money or um, just binging on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, and so the goal of Mooksley is to shift. I want um, our profession, our next shift in clinical um, care to be care for us. Because um, the research is showing that you can do it for a certain period of time, um, but it's very limited the amount of time that you can give care to others in excess of what you give to yourself. And so that's where a lot of burnout comes from. Um, so that's a very quick overview of kind of my professional journey. And um, I'd love to get into some of the questions that you have. Yes. So do you want me to read those questions to you or do you have? Sure, yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Hold on one second. I had to leave the kitchen and I forgot my iPad. Okay. <laughs> <Hold> <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. I also, I had to keep the dogs occupied, so I'm trying to keep Same. On them. Same. I have a little Yorkie and I told my husband, oh. I'm like, you could just keep her. <laughs> yes, I went to. Um, it's their birthday this month, so they got. Their I own, saw, their birthday, yeah, their birthday coupon. So I went to Petco and got them a bunch of um, treats, and then I got them a Kong fill, or a bone filled with uh, pumpkin. So they're over here. Good like, call, um, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's. I hope it transferred to my. If not, let me just go. Sorry, guys. Hi, everyone joining. Um, let me go to my... Did I email them to you or did I... No, I sent them I think you out. DM them to me, um, which, yeah, I can try to okay. pull them up, too. I think I remember... Um, I think I, re I remember kind of what the... I got them. You got them? <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. So... Um, you told us briefly the um, type of anesthesia that you are really focused on is ultrasound guided um, anesthesia. Mostly. Yes. Yeah. Is that your favorite type of anesthesia to do? So I was a pediatric emergency room nurse um, for about three years. I did almost entirely peds and I still love pediatric anesthesia. Um, okay. So I really enjoy the days. Um, where I do pediatrics and then um, kind of that ties in with the um, regional <laughs> Kong's gone <laughs> kind of um, it ties in with um, regional nerve blocks, which are when we inject numbing medicine around um, nerves so that the pain signals can't be transmitted. Um, there's so much in the news about the opioid ac epidemic and um through the attention to that and then research development even outside of that, we're realizing that opioids really aren't great as first-line pain medications. And so um, opioid-free anesthesia has really become a big push and 
nerve blocks are a huge core and complement to that. And so opioid-free anesthesia is um, something I'm also really interested in and looking at how can we start in pre-op, which is the area, you know, the patient is before their procedure, how can we start there and then put a plan in place that goes all the way through um, mm -hmm. that manages the patient's pain because in the past it's kind of been this approach in anesthesia where we just give them something for anxiety um, immediately prior to the surgery and then give them fairly high dose narcotic medications during and then they go to recovery and there's not always the follow through or thought of did I give medications in care in the operating room that's going to set them up to be pain controlled, nausea free, able to get up um, six hours and eight hours and 12 hours from now. Mm -hmm. And um, we're finding that it's a better experience for the patient, it's safer, and then also cost is such a huge factor in healthcare. And, um, you know, more and more hospitals are saying this person can't spend the night tonight. So then it's how can I come up with a plan where they can safely go home and be pain controlled? Um, so I would say pediatrics and then all like all things ultrasound and then op opioid free anesthesia are things I really enjoy. Awesome. Those are all the things that I don't do. So I'm so glad for CRNAs like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I love about um, like the social media community of CRNAs because I learned so much, you know, because yeah. that means you're doing a whole um, body of anesthesia that I don't do. Right. So there's so much we can learn from each other. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Did you see my live with um, Diane Miller, the CEO of PLS? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love what she's doing. Yeah. That's yeah, incredible. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. I've uh, messaged Diane and I'm just like, I just love the spirit of innovation she's bringing mm -hmm. to our profession. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because that takes a whole other, you know, type of courage. So. Yeah, she's amazing. I um, That was her first time doing a live. So. It was, I learned so much from her because I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not a big pediatric lover. Not that I don't like kids, but we know that pediatric sure. anesthesia yeah. is very different than adult anesthesia. So yeah, well, absolutely. It's just not something I ever fell in love with. <laughs> so thank God for you and Diane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next question. What types of shifts do you work so, like I said, I've done a lot of rural independent practice. Um, most recently, I was in that setting for six years. Um, and that type of um, kind of shifts where there was f five nurse anesthetists, we didn't have any anesthesiologists that covered the hospital. And we covered um, the operating room, acute pain management, any um, ER, emergency room interventions that would require um, anesthesia skills, and then obstetrics, so emergency C-sections, epidurals. So that model, um, we didn't really have shifts. We just had the, the first person to go home, the last person to go home, and then, you know, everybody fell in the middle. And if you were on call, you would typically start at 7 in the morning, and you would go home when the work was done. And sometimes that meant 2 in the afternoon, and sometimes that literally meant 2 or 3 in the morning. Um, the position I've been in in the last two years um, has been a little bit more typical shift type work um, and I was doing mostly 10 and 12 hour shifts but we are um, majorly shifting our anesthesia practice and um, we will be doing 24 hour in-house call shifts um, it's just kind of everything in between. So um, it's an exciting time for nurse anesthetists um, where I currently work. And um, I think one of the questions was, did I understand correctly? One of the questions was, is my facility hiring nurse anesthetist? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to come to Grand Rapids, Michigan, <laughs> um, they've been rated the top 10 cities um, for many very positive things in recent years. Um, St. Mary's Hospital, uh, which is Trinity Health, uh, under the umbrella of Trinity Health in Grand Rapids, we are hiring. Um, just DM me um, 
and uh, we can swap contact information and um, I can facilitate you. Oh, hi. Hi, gorgeous. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, we're not we're not that far of a drive from Kalamazoo. I'm not sure. We're actually hiring nurses right now too. We're hiring um, all kinds of healthcare professionals. So awesome. St. Mary's is a great place to work. Um, it's a great place to be a nurse anesthetist, and um, I like that. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a great place to be a nurse anesthetist. So if anybody's interested in that, um, we are actually hiring nurse anesthetist, and then. Um, we have an Epic Go Live, um, which is a type of electronic medical record, January 1st. And um, if any nurses are looking to um, work and just pick up through that time, um, you're welcome to. So, gorgeous. Um, if that's something you want to come up north and do a couple of shifts and help us get online with Epic, um, that would be great. So, that's yeah, awesome. um, that's kind of the hiring status of our facility. And the shifts that I have worked. Do, does your facility allow um, nurses who want to become CRNAs to shadow CRNAs? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. All right, guys. So. Yes. And yeah. There you yep. go. Um, we have people um, come through fairly often to shadow uh, because some ORs are like particularly closed um, mm -hmm. and it can be a hard opportunity to get. Um, I sat on the interview um, committee for my alma mater for several rounds of interviews. And I would definitely say, um, even if you know, like, I want to be a nurse anesthetist and that's what I'm doing, I would definitely say sh shadow someone because they're going to ask you that in your interview. Did you shadow anyone? Yes, they are. So for all, <laughs> all of you who are always messaging me about um, needing someone to shadow Mm -hmm. Um, here is Sarah's right here. She's in Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Correct. Michigan. Yep. Mm -hmm. So she is a person that you can contact, um, about shadowing. So yeah, thank you. I wonder if that's the same Trinity health that, um, took over at one of the facilities here that I used to work at. Um, is, um, is it a Catholic hospital? Yep. Most likely it is. Um, cause you're kind of on the East coast, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they have a lot of presence on the East Coast, and so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. at the Catholic hospitals. Yep, yep, it would be the same one. Another, um, just to circle back to the shadowing, um, mm -hmm. for people that are currently nurses and want to get some um, experience shadowing a nurse anesthetist, another great way to do it and do something really positive is to do a surgical missions trip. Mm. Um so I have someone that wants to be a nurse anesthetist and is currently a surgical intensive care unit nurse. And um, so he came down, we went to Honduras and did a surgical mission together. Um, he was the recovery room nurse, but we did the first case of every day. He did the whole case with me because, um, you know, obviously no patients in the recovery room at that point. So that's a great thing to do if you're looking at applying to CRNA school. Um, it's awesome for shadowing. And then also um, schools love to see that um, you're altruistic, you know, yes, and yes. what you're looking to do. So I, I love that. Nobody's ever given that um, advice before. Yeah. So that's why I love doing these lives because I swear I learned something new um, <laughs> each time, you know, uh, because although anesthesia, although we're kind of taught broadly, everything there's just so many different ways right and, um so that's awesome yes thank you yeah. I definitely mentioned that um when others inbox me about you know needing shadow experience that's a that's a great yeah experience. it's a great way if you're a nurse to to go you know expose yourself to that mm -hmm. awesome. and hopefully it's a great way to establish a ha you know a habit um, yeah that's, that's just part of your professionalism you know mm -hmm. as you move through your career so yeah, I can't wait to do a mission. I want to be debt free before I do it. So, um, sure. By yeah. 2021, I'll be able to, yeah. to do them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. So, how did you come up with the idea to develop Mooksley? Mook, am I saying so, correctly? You are. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, 
so Muxley was born out of, um, I was in the middle of being in an extremely toxic work environment and um, used just some of the very basic things I knew to try to deal with that. But it was a pretty intense situation. And I was so fortunate that in the middle of that, um, I started practicing yoga for fitness. And um, the yoga instructor was actually Joan Mudgett. She's going to be um, teaching all of the yoga sessions at our Mooksley April 2020 retreat in Santa Barbara. Um, and she teaches yoga as a lifestyle and as a perspective and as you a way that you move through the day, which is really what the discipline of yoga is about. It's not about holding myself into a pretzel or spending a certain amount on a rubber mat on the floor. And so through the clarity and growth that I had in um, practicing in her studio, I was able to get a lot of clarity about my professional situation and find a really healthy and positive way to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I just felt frustrated, um, thankful for the, that um, experience, um, but frustrated because we get so much education as nurse anesthetists about how to care for patients and how to handle clinical emergencies but not how to care for ourselves and how to handle essentially professional emergencies. Yeah. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is something as a community that we're desperate for. And so um, for people that follow my Mooksley Insta, um, you've probably seen, um, it's kind of through a long turn of events, but um, I freelance or do locums. Um, as a florist. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I have a background in being a florist and being an event planner mm -hmm. and um, also am, have, you know, done professional speaking and being an educator. So I kind of took all of those things and being a yogi and Mooksley was born out of that. So our whole mantra at Mooksley is we're a community of nurse anesthetists where the whole person is wholly supported. And um, our first retreat in this is in April. There's going to be a definite yoga element of it. And um, I say you can be someone who's practiced yoga forever or we can take you from zero to yoga. Um, there's no like pre-experience in yoga required. Um, so that's going to be a huge part of it. We're going to do um, some practice that helps address the physical injuries that nurse anesthetists experience from the constant forward bending, lifting, and twisting. And then we're going to do some breathing um, classes that will help you as a professional um, to kind of reset um, when needed, but then also that you can help your patients with. Um, but we're going to have a hour long session on finances because that's a huge part of health, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Sam Simon, um, has, uh, just an incredible, uh, investment service and he is going to be speaking an hour on essentially, do you want to pay, you want to pay compound interest or you want to earn compound interest mm. and looking at the, the difference that that makes in your life. And I know you're so passionate about that, Crystal. I love your yeah. debt-free journey and how committed you are to that. Um, we're going to have a four-hour workshop on how to negotiate everything from just small communication um, conversations with, like, your children or your family mm -hmm. to how to negotiate a really important work contract and make sure that you're getting what you need for mm -hmm. what you're worth as a professional. And then also how to negotiate professionally day to day to establish safe boundaries for yourself mm -hmm. to help with that issue of burnout. Um, we have Dr. Marvin Belzer coming from the UCLA mindfulness academic research center. He's going to be doing a four hour workshop on mindfulness and self care. And then we have Allie McLean coming. She is a nurse anesthetist at Boston children's and has taught new England university's wellness classes. Um, for a long time and it's just going to be kind of bringing it all together for us and integrating um, 
What does it look like at the bedside in pre-op to be mindful? Those types of things. And then um, I'll be doing a couple of talks as well. So our goal is just to bring together a community of nurse anesthetists that are passionate about wholehearted living and have people leave with new friendships, a new sense of community, um, and the tools to just move through life differently. Um, so yeah, that's Mooksley. Awesome. And you said the dates yeah. are going to be in April of 2020? Yep, April 26th um, through the 30th. It's a Sunday in, um, Thursday out. It's at, um, this is <laughs> El Capitan Canyon, one of their mugs. Um, oh. It's beautiful um, canyon in out just outside of Santa Barbara. It's about 15 minutes from the Santa Barbara airport. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the term glamping, but it's glamorous camping. So um, they have they have yurts, um, they have safari style tents, and then they have gorgeous cedar cabins that aren't camping at all. That have right. That's where I'm going to be too. <laughs> Yeah, they have full thing. kitchenettes and bathrooms <laughs> and coffee makers and um, just beautiful. Um, the cabins either look out over the river that runs through the canyon or just up the gorgeous canyon wall. It's just an incredibly peaceful place to be. And then it's just right across the road from the Pacific Ocean. So there's hiking trails throughout the canyon. Um, there's massage therapy on site. Um, <laughs> Um, and locally sourced, um, healthy food. So we're, yeah, we're so excited. And, um, as with when you launch anything, um, our intent is I'm putting it out there and I know over time, the community that comes together will tell me like what their needs are, what they need it to be, what they need it to look like going mm -hmm. forward. So and how many CEUs um, will 20. 20. Okay. 20, C 20 class A CEUs. Class yep. A. And so it's only yeah. for CRNAs. Um, um, no. So that's actually on our frequently asked questions. Um, we definitely are CRNA centric. But um, if you're a CRNA and you have a friend in healthcare or otherwise that is, you know, says, I can use all of this and I'm interested and I want to come too they are absolutely welcome to come. Um, the very um, little of the lecture content will only apply to giving anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And so, um, especially, you know, nurse practitioners, um, really anybody who's looking to take better care of themselves as a human so they can take better care of the humans around them mm -hmm. um, will find this helpful. And then if you want to come um, with your friend or family member, um, you just want to be like, we call them a companion. Um, so you're not attending the sessions, you're not doing the yoga, but you're there to hike and have fun. And um, you can absolutely do that. And there's no fee um, to come along in that capacity. So. Okay. Very yeah. good. How, how long have you been working on putting this all together? Um, so I would say the concept for the idea, um, I've had for about two years and then um, about a year ago I started with um, you know as an entrepreneur thinking okay step by step how am I going to move forward and then there comes that point um, where it, you could do all the research in the world and you'll never be a hundred percent ready to do anything so at some point you just gotta jump and you just gotta go and so um, we launched uh, June 29th. Hush, stop. <laughs> now the Kong is empty, so now yeah. they're going to cry. <laughs> stop. Okay, sorry about that. Um, well, that's awesome. So two years. That's not bad at all. And now it's coming yeah. to fruition. So. Yeah, it's really exciting. And um my whole thing as a person, um, I think a lot of nurse anesthetists were very type A personalities, were mm -hmm. perfectionists. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the, all of the metrics that you have to meet to get into CRNA school and say, stay in CRNA school are performance and outcome based. 
And so for me, at least it's very easy to start living my life for those types of things. And so um, when I started Moopsly, I just said, I'm defining success with this as I did it. Like I, I want to, you know, I want to live trying and that whole saying, like, um, die with memories, not with dreams. Mm -hmm. And so that was my whole, um, mantra as I started this. And as I continue it is to just live honoring what's in my heart. And then, um, you know, just trusting that how people, you know, will or won't respond to that, um, community that, that comes out of that. But that's been a real shift for me as a, you know, type A, we're all high performing professionals. And even in the operating room, we have to have 100% success to keep our patients yeah. safe. Um, yeah. And so to be kind to myself, I've really shifted how I define success in my personal life. And um, I'm just so thankful for all of the growth that's come out of honoring what's in my heart. And I see that coming through on your Instagram, because right now what's in your heart is to be free of debt. Yeah. And it, it seems like you're sharing daily, like most people would be like, oh my word, that's so hard and it's such a burden and who would want to live that way? And at least what I'm seeing come through for you is just you're experiencing layer after layer of freedom and joy. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and showing that at the same time I'm living, like I'm right. Not, you know, yeah. I'm not yeah. at work all the time. I'm not right. I, mean, I don't, I don't do a whole lot outside of work. I do what I sure. need to do. Um, yeah. And I think when you, when you're in like a, I, I call it a spiritual kind of awakening that I've kind of. Absolutely. Into. Yeah. But when you're in that, you see that all that other stuff is, it's just mm -hmm. stuff and it's not necessary and it doesn't. Right. I love that. It doesn't bring you more happiness. It doesn't take away the sadness. You have to get to the yes. internal problem. So um, yes. that's why I'm sharing it so that people can next year when I'm like debt free, right. no more, they can see right. someone. Who yeah. Didn't. So, yeah. And I think it's just, it's so inspiring. And I see, you know, the messages that you're sharing and um, when we honor who we are um, and live wholeheartedly. It's hard and it's scary and it's vulnerable, but it helps us and it helps everyone around us and it's life giving. And yeah. so um, I, I don't succeed uh, in that every day to the level I would like to, but um, my goal is to show up every day. Try, you know? Yep. That's all. That's all you can do. Um, yeah. I was just actually listening to something on uh, YouTube. I I listen to all different spiritual stuff, but it was a guy talking about compounding intent, not compounding interest. And he was yeah. just saying each small bit of making a change in your life. Yes. Deals. You may not see the big transition mm -hmm. all at once, but right. if you keep making those small changes each day, you will manifest what it is, whether that's a better body or better or longer hair. I mean, just whatever it is you're trying to do, you know, you have to, yeah, you have to show intent to it each and every day. So I love that. Yeah. Setting your intention is, is so important. And mm -hmm. that's why we, you know, made part of our brand, like move your mindset because that's what mm -hmm. you have to do. You have yes. to be willing to get uncomfortable and move the way that you've seen things. And there's that whole saying, like, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We are. Yeah. And so being able to step into, you know, maybe to see things differently, I, I need to be different. Mm -hmm. And that is scary and hard, but um, it can, it can be so life giving. And I think it is much easier to do and sustain in community um, which is why I love what, you know, you're sharing, um, and, and is the community that we're building through Moosley. Awesome. Awesome. All right. 
next question because I don't want time to run out because it goes by <laughs> so quick when we're doing these. All right, so you um, are an adjunct professor still, or yeah. that was mm -hmm. in the past? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do yep. you teach? So um, the lecture that I gave the my last semester of um, graduate school was on anaphylaxis and allergic reactions in the operating room. Um, so I've taught that almost every year since. And um, for people that are interested in teaching, um, just as a aside, I would just say, just do it. Put yourself in front of the room. It's like anything else in life. You get better every time. Um, but for clinicians, the benefit of teaching is it helps you stay up to date. And yeah. I mentioned that I went into rural independent practice right out of school. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been in the OR for six months, and I had my first allergic reaction in the OR oh. in the operating room. And so I was so thankful that I had taught that lecture mm -hmm. because I knew what the current research was. I knew kind of what the decision-making tree was, and I just worked my way through that. So um, I've taught on that. And then um, another um, – piece of advice I'd like to give if you are interested in teaching or you get asked to speak is um, teach on things you're passionate about. It's hard to put a lot of time and work into studying and preparing a lecture about something that you don't really have that much interest yeah. in. Yeah. So I have a lot of interest in obstetrics. Um, so I um, have taught on obstetrics and then um, I'm now teaching um, the lecture and hands on for transthoracic echo so there's two types of ultrasounds of the heart um, one is with the patient asleep and the ultrasound goes down the food tube and then the other one is called um, transthoracic and that's where we just put an ultrasound probe outside the chest and so most recently that's what i've been teaching the most is um, point of care ultrasound for transthoracic echo um, it's just a great tool to use um, in the pre-op area really operating room, recovery room, all of it, um, to assess patients. Okay. Can you um, talk a little bit more about the POCUS? Yeah. So point of care ultrasound, um, it's the, the lecture I give, I actually have slides of it. You know, it's kind of the picture of the doctor or nurse with the stethoscope around their neck. That's what mm -hmm. we've, we've always seen. Mm -hmm. So I have um, pictures of people with ultrasound probes around their neck because okay. That's where we're headed. Ultrasound is going to be the next stethoscope. And mm -hmm. ultrasound has come down to a price point. You can buy an ultrasound um, probe that attaches to your smartphone for less than $2,000 now. Wow. Yeah. And you can assess people's lungs with that. You can assess their heart. Um, if a patient tells you that they didn't eat and you know they did, you can scan their stomach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, it's called point of care because it is when you go and have, let's say, a CAT scan, we would call that quantitative. They're using very precise measurements and millimeters um, when they're describing things. That's mm -hmm. quantitative. Point of care ultrasound is qualitative. So when we were doing an ultrasound of the heart in the preoperative area, I always, um, when I teach, I say you're looking at the main pump of the heart, the left ventricle, and you're saying, does it look pretty good, just okay, or really bad? And so you can get that information in real time and then adapt your anesthetic based on that information. Um, and especially in the recovery room, what people have going on with their lungs um, can be really important for us to know quickly. And ultrasound is much more sensitive to pick up if, when you were under anesthesia, the contents of your stomach came up your food tube and went down into your breathing tube. Um, ultrasound is sensitive for that right away. To pick that up on chest x-ray, you need to wait 12, 8 to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a patient that has low blood pressure, there is a point-of-care ultrasound exam where you're quickly scanning the heart, lungs, and abdomen. It's called RUSH for Rapid Ultrasound Assessment of Hypotension. And you can quickly see, is this a circulation problem? Is it a breathing problem? Or do we have a bleeding problem in the abdomen where we're losing volume? And so um, critical care and emergency medicine 
are way ahead of anesthesia on this curve. And actually the first point of care ultrasound training I took was um, a critical care emergency medicine course. Um, wow. Yeah, so this has been at the bedside in the intensive care units and in the emergency department for years now. And um, I would say it is still more the exception than the rule in anesthesia. Um, and so we need to keep up. And especially as nurse anesthetist, we need to be practicing at the top of our license um, to continue to advance as a profession. Mm -hmm. And this is a way for us to do that. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I'll have to definitely learn more about that. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I, I honestly hadn't heard, heard of it. Yeah. If people, if you're interested in kind of Googling around, um, the Butterfly IQ is one of the most popular probes to plug into your iPhone. Okay. Um, for like bedside care. Awesome. Yeah. And it, and it works yeah. with any, it works with Android or only iPhone? Android and iPhone or iPad. Yep. Okay. Yep. Very good. Yeah. All right. Next question. So what are the yeah. pros and cons with working independent practice as a CRNA? Okay. So the pros are, there are, a lot less barriers to you being able to make decisions and just do the best thing for your patient. Um, cause it's just you. Mm -hmm. And so you can put together that plan and execute it. Um, I would say the cons that a lot of nurse anesthetists struggle with in the independent setting is you're, you're usually in a rural setting. Um, and like I was saying in the job that I did for six years, five of us covering 24 seven, and so I said it was a lifestyle, not a job. Um, and I so enjoyed caring for our community um, at any hour of the day and night. But honestly, that does get taxing. And then if you have, you know, a colleague that needs surgery or whatever it is, your already very full professional obligation just got 20% higher for whatever interim yeah that they are out. Um, so I would say the, the cons are just, um, there's not a lot of flexibility in your schedule. Um, some vacations typically for people working in that setting, which are so important to step away, you have to plan months in advance. Mm -hmm. And then y your coverage has to be familiar, just like any anesthetic setting, they have to be familiar with that anesthetic setting. Um, right. And uh, I would say you're pulling from just a smaller like pool of people mm -hmm. that have had that type of practice. So yeah. those yeah. would be the con. Yeah. But I found it very rewarding. It's harder um, to like, unless you know well in advance that so-and-so is going to be out because they're pregnant and they're taking maternity leave right. or they need, their, right. you know, hip surgery right. or whatever, um, you know, then you can hopefully find a locums who, can come right. in and you know do everything right. and and fill in but um if not yeah, yeah and even like if you're sick if you can stand mm. i mean the expectation is you're, you're there, there because if you have a day of issue that keeps you from being in the operating room that entire day is not going to happen for that surgeon mm -hmm. and patients mm -hmm. um there's no float there's no backup no. Um, so honestly, it's challenging to take good care of yourself. Yeah. Um, that's the definite challenge of it. Yeah. Same with, um, 1099. I've, I've spoken about yes. it before, um, yeah. to people it's, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's not great, but right. there are some cons that come with being 1099. It's not all, yeah. Ooh, I, I have a business so I can write this off and that off. And it's like, whoa slow down. <laughs> yeah. The, whole the buck other... stops with you. Yeah. I mean, uh, especially 1099 on all fronts. Like, yeah, yeah. You and are the business. You are the business. If you don't work, you don't get paid. If right. you want a vacation, you know, you got to make sure you have the money saved up. All, all those things that yeah. you need to know beforehand if you're going to do straight 1099. So, yeah, um, I think a big yeah. thing um, is to know your why. So mm -hmm. if you're doing 1099, what's your why? What's your motivating factor? Why is that 
a good fit for you. And if you don't know that and it's not, um, then I see Brianna's asking a question. Any ideas for DMP projects related to OB? I'm a first year student and entering clinical in December, but just trying to think ahead. Yes, Brianna, stand by. I've got some thoughts for you. Um, <laughs> um, so to know your why, um, if yeah. what whatever practice setting you're in, whatever professional setup you have, um, it has to be driven out of what is in your heart and works for you and your family. Um, otherwise, your satisfaction with it is going to be very short lived. Yeah. And as you have to make decisions when challenges come up, because they will in any professional setting, it's hard to make wise decisions if you don't know your why. Mm -hmm. so. Very true. And sometimes you have to go back to your why, like you're, when you're frustrated and you're like, oh my God, this sucks. Yes. It's done. Sometimes you have to yes. feel it, it back yes. in. And then, because like mm -hmm. my why is because I'm trying to get. for a job kind of at the start of your last year. Mm -hmm. So I knew and had committed to um, at least six months out that I was going to go into rural independent practice. So I said to our program faculty, I want to spend my last couple months of the program in that setting. And they said to me, no, I think we should keep you at our biggest hospital. Uh oh, what happened? I don't know what happened. Hi guys. I have no clue what just happened. Um, let's see if we can get her back here. Sorry, y'all can hear. I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, it just cut out. So um, I was just saying, when I found out I took a job in the rural setting, I said to our program faculty, I want you to um, let me do my last, you know, mm -hmm. four months of the program in the rural setting. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we see it just the opposite. We think you should do your last four months in the biggest, you know, most acute hospital we have. And I was like, I'm so sick of program faculty that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but of course, they were so right because that's the argument for both is – the things that you learn taking care of that crashing trauma patient in a level one trauma facility, mm -hmm. that's going to help you when you're in the rural independent setting and they call you and say, um, we have someone, I've had this, we've had someone that just crawled out of the woods. We don't know what happened. They are covered in blood. There's a huge puncture wound in their neck. We need you to come secure their airway. Mm -hmm. And so if you've done that in the level one trauma setting where you're getting that over and over and over again, um, you'll have exposure to that in managing blood pressure issues, major vascular issues, and really, really um, sick heart patients will help you then in the rural setting when they bring you this chart and they say, so maybe the case is just a hip fracture, but it's a 90 year old patient and they've got this, 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 and this wrong with their heart. Well, if you spend a lot of time um, doing really sick hearts in a large facility, you would know exactly what you need to help that pump get mm -hmm. through a completely different surgery. And mm -hmm. so I think there's completely legitimate arguments for both. Um, what I don't agree with is people that say you should never go into rural independent right out of school. Um, there was at least three of us that did that out of my class. A lot of um, nurse anesthetists practice independently in the state of Michigan. We have a lot of rural areas. And um, we had to find our feet fast and support each other really well. Um, but we all did great. And it was a really positive experience. So again, I say go back to your why. Honor your why. Um, and in the rural setting that I was in, we had a CRNA that had been in the level one regional center practice, that was it. Her entire career had never done a nerve block, had never done obstetrics. And she came and worked with us and it went great. And she was incredible. Um, and so don't ever feel like, oh, because I've done this, I can't do this. 
Um, mm -hmm. You can always learn, you can always shift, you can always adapt. So what you do out of school doesn't mean that that's what you have to do the rest of your career. And I'll just add on two pieces to that. The first I'll say um, is it, it really does depend on your program and how well prepared absolutely um, you yes feel you know some some people like i honestly i felt like i needed a little more hand holding um straight out of school i could i could do cases and everything you know fine on my own pass my board sure but i just felt like i wanted just a little more support for you know a few months and so i went to a level one teaching hospital but i will say this about going to a level one teaching hospital if there's a residency program you may not get all yeah. of the big Good advice anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the residents are gonna are gonna get the the large stuff first. They're they're first on the list to get those things. Um, so just be mindful when you're looking for a job. You know, after school of of those things as well. And CRNA programs. If your CRNA program, your primary rotation site has anesthesia residents. It's going to be a similar dynamic. Yes. Yes, it will. <laughs> so um, those are questions that you guys would want to ask during your interview or probably yes. have to research beforehand so that you kind of know what you're getting into beforehand. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. Five minutes left um, for our hour. And I saw a question. Let's see. Does travel nursing look good when applying to CRNA school? I'm currently a CVICU new travel nurse. Yes, it does. So um, as I was saying, there's five programs for CRNAs in the state of Michigan, and um, they're all very highly rated schools. I mean, any CRNA program is competitive to get into, but Michigan is a hard state to get into. And... Um, our requirements um, as a professional body are that you have to have done one year of intensive care unit um, to go to CRNA school. Well, as I said, I was an emergency room nurse for 10 years. Mm. And um, when we came home from our last travel nurse assignment is when I started an ICU job and applied to CRNA school. So they said, tell us, how you feel like e emergency nursing being your primary background, um, how has that, you know, prepared you to do this? And so um, I said this in my interview and it, it was great. Um, I said, well, in CRNA school, I'm going to be doing a different rotation every month. Um, my program, you were in a different institution almost every month to get your pediatric, to get your rural, to get your obstetric. And so I said, I'm going to be able to do that extremely well. I've done that for the last three years. I'm very comfortable showing up at a hospital, being shown where the bathroom is and going. Like, that. <laughs> yeah, my husband and I called it a bathroom orientation. There's the bathroom. Here's your assignment. Let's go. Yeah, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> and, um, and that was true. So, um, and then also you can just bring up, there's so much diversity um, in the type of care patients receive. Mm -hmm. So when we did trauma on the West Coast, uh, it was incredibly well done, but they weren't so good at cardiac. Um, we spent two summers working on um, Cape Cod off of Massachusetts, and um, they were not good at trauma, <laughs> but their <laughs> cardiac, their door to stent time was incredible. Um, and to facilitate that, I found myself in uh, the heart catheterization and helping start a cape case um and so you get exposure to strengths all over the country and um mm -hmm. i can say my personal experience was it definitely prepared me better and yes the program did see it as a positive all right yeah okay sarah so i want to just thank you first of all for doing this live with me i've learned thank you so much from you and our really goes by so fast and i feel like yeah 
<laughs> like, there's so much more we can talk about. So we're gonna have to reschedule another live for another time. Yeah, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> but is there any closing words that you would like to give? You have like two minutes um, before Instagram completely shuts off on us. So are there any closing words you'd like to say? Yeah. Yeah, I would um, like to thank you um, for what you're putting out there in the community that you've created and for inviting me to come be a part of that, first of all. And then I would just say, I, I feel like there's a lot of um, type A, hard driving healthcare professionals that um, are part of your community and um, are part of the Mooksley community. And I would just encourage everyone to pause and stop and to take some of that drive that you've been putting out, 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 and to look inward mm -hmm. and to learn your why on the smallest level and on the grandest level and to have the courage to step out and um, start practicing some self-care and look at what it looks like for yourself, just like Crystal has. What does it mean for me to honor what's in my heart and to live wholeheartedly? And if there's any way that myself or the Mooksley community can support you with that, we're here for you, DM me, um, jump on our Facebook page, whatever it is. Um, you can go to our website. Um, you can email me right from our website. But um, I would love to be a part of facilitating that for you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, thank Sarah. Thank you. I will definitely get this up on my YouTube page. So wonderful. many more can see and learn and become part of the Mooksley community. So Love it. Love it. Let's do it again. All right. Have a good okay. night. Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.